Uh, thank you very much, uh, Irid. I'd like to thank the organizers who've been wonderful to me, uh, and uh, Irid and my colleagues at Free Thought. Um, I, I came up with a solution while I was sitting there to the size of the room. I'm going to lecture on uh, accounting right now, so uh, this, could, uh, this could relieve some of the crowd problems. <laughs> and uh, as is typical with an accounting lecture, it's going to have three parts, capital, labor, and revolutionary becoming. I'm, I'm going to spend most of the time on capital because it's an unfortunate uh, consequence of being in a business school that you tend to talk uh, and capital tends to come out of your mouth. Um, being an automatic subject, it has to find others like me who think we're actual subjects to speak through. So um, I'll spend more of the time on that than on the other areas, but hopefully we'll get to some of the other points as well. Now, I'm not just going to be talking about accounting, but also about accountants. Uh, and towards the middle, I, I want to come back to the biography that uh, Irit mentioned of, of myself and talk a little bit about uh, why I'm here uh, in, the, in that context. But to begin, what I want to do is I just want to take us quickly through a kind of prehistory of the present, as I think I would call it. Take us through these moments of neoliberalism to the point where uh, I might be standing up here talking about accounting, and you might actually be sitting there listening uh, to that. And in order to do that, I want to take you through a quick history. I'm a little less interested in this larger history, which, for instance, if you uh, went to Maurizio Lazzarato's lecture, you heard already in some ways. I'm more interested in the mechanisms that come into being uh, as a result of that history. So I'll move through it a little bit quickly. Um, but of course, um, I don't mean to give it short shrift by doing that. So if we think of the end of the 70s, be the beginning of the 80s, that's this moment when we begin to recognize something like financialization uh, coming into being through a series of kinds of deregulations. Then we have to also focus a little bit on how this happens, how they make it happen, how it actually is carried out. And that's what I want to try to do. But at the very beginning, I want to say something about that moment in the 70s. And Franco Barati spoke about it a little bit as well, and he identified a particular year that he thought was important. You know, at a certain moment, there is a kind of subjectivation going on in social movements, in wildcat strikes of unions, in anti-colonial movements, in all kinds of forms which Management, on behalf of capital, watches pretty closely. And on the one hand, it becomes really almost impossible to deal with this subjectivation. On the other hand, it's kind of enticing, kind of interesting, what's coming up at that moment. And from that point forward, the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s, management will have an eye on subjectivation in both of these registers. On the one hand, it's a pain in the ass. On the other hand, there's something interesting about it. In the meantime, though, it, they have to deal with the fact that it's cutting into profits. They have to deal with the fact that you know, they, they're meeting all kinds of resistances that previously they had not encountered. This leads to a story that you know of political pressures and organizations to deregulate. Uh, in, interestingly, you know, it, uh, the first thing the United States is, does is start to deregulate itself, and the states start to fight each other in the late 70s, and South Dakota declares that it, you can charge any interest rate you want in the world and, and come here. That's why, if you're an American, you still get your credit cards from South Dakota, because uh, they can do whatever they want to you uh, when it comes to interest. All you got to do is miss one payment, and the next thing you know, you could be uh, you know, in debt for life. So they start with each other, but eventually, of course, they have global ambitions around this deregulation, and they get plenty of help from all over the world, uh, as we know. This deregulation and financialization goes through phases. So at first, that financialization is largely about turning to industry and financializing it. So that means going into the factory and saying, in what ways could we become more efficient, so they still have an idea of efficiency. They're largely working through something that we call value engineering. What, what more value can we get out of this thing? And they have a series of reductive exercises they do for that. 
But they're largely thinking at that point in terms of ways in which they can leverage factory assets. That gradually leads also to a series of outsourcing because they stop owning the factories essentially through financialization. They're able to outsource it. When they're done with the factories, they begin to work in these hybrid models, like at GM, where suddenly they introduce all kinds of financial products into GM's portfolio. So GM starts issuing credit cards, et cetera, et cetera. And then finally, in the era we're most familiar with, they financialize themselves. So the banks financialize themselves. And I'll illustrate what I mean by all this, but ultimately what we're interested in is what kind of mechanisms this requires. When I say they financialize themselves, I mean, you might remember, uh, if you, if you um, remember London's Occupy movement, that at one point early on they broke into a bank. And of course, there was nothing in the bank, because there isn't any, anything in banks anymore, right? Uh, this is what I mean by the financialization of the banks. Essentially, the banks hollowed themselves out with debt and did to themselves what they had previously done to industry and previously done in all kinds of other hybrid models and experiments. For instance, um, Enron. Enron is a very interesting model because essentially Enron is just a series of locked contracts around debt. There's no company there. In fact, the very few times that they let Enron actually do anything, they completely fucked it up. Once in India during the, the, the Hindu nationalist government, they brought them in, they fucked up a big power plant there. And of course, they browned out all of California. So they're actually better off when they were just dealing with finance than when they actually tried to be a power company. And yet, of course, every year they won the awards for being the best company. And they didn't win the awards because people were fooled. The industry awards were given to them because they were inventing a new model. It was precisely what business means when they say innovation. I mean, it was criminal, it was horrible for people, but that's what they mean when they say innovation. And a lot of what uh, Enron did, and a lot of what those guys went to jail for, not only is legal now, but it's standard practice. So, and which is, which is if you watch finance, basically the way that the thing unfolds. The first set of guys go to jail, the second set of guys make the money. Now, what I want to say about this is that, of course, it's fine to give that kind of history and, you know, to, uh, to talk about what we've seen unfold, but, but how does it really work? And so, I guess one way to do it is I could, I just want to illustrate it quickly um, with, uh, with this place, for instance, how, how it actually would operate. So, at a certain point in this history, you get, of course, a class of people who have to do this work, which you know as the management consultant. Somebody has to come in and begin that financialization process. That financialization process is not done by bankers. And that's quite important for what I want to say later on. It's not done by bankers. It's done by a separate class of people called management con con uh, uh, um, consultants, many of whom come out of accounting firms. So at a certain point, the accountant firms split in half. Just as the banks have come together, the account firms split in half. So famously, the banks break the wall down between their real banking and their investment banking, their so-called real banking, their investment banking. At the same time, the accounting firms are splitting in half, although talking to each other, between people who do what we would understand as accounting, that is auditing the books, essentially, and people who are doing management consulting. Now, you might ask, why would an accountant be so well-placed to do management consulting, and this is part of the story that I want to tell. Why is it the accountant? So let me just illustrate by using the, the place that we're in today. If I were brought in here from PricewaterhouseCoopers or Ernest & Young, I would start pretty simply. You know, first I'd go through the, the annual reports and what the place say, says about itself. Then after that, which is mostly for show, I get the HR records, which is what I'm really interested in as a first step, right? And I go through the HR records, and I begin to figure out, and if, it's even better if they've already put something in place, like activity-based accounting or all that stuff, but let's just suppose they haven't. I go through all those records, and what I'm looking essentially to do is shave as much labor as I can, right? And that's a story that we would know. So if I could, and it depends on what jurisdiction I'm in and you know, what, um, what the laws are like, I want to take as many parts of this place and contract them out. So I certainly don't want anyone working in my kitchen. I mean, that's the first thing that's got to go. I got to contract that out. I want to contract out security. And each time, 
I'll ratchet down the labor contract and I'll make it more precarious. Right? This is a story that we, we know, and this is we know what management consultants do. But of course, you wouldn't take them in. They would be unsustainable if they weren't offering something from the other hand. So we have to also talk about that a little bit. So I get in there, and that's the first thing I do. I start to contract out, and then I'm stuck with a certain amount of people that I can't get rid of. So if I can, if I'm in the right kind of jurisdiction, like the UK, for instance, I put them on zero-hour contracts, right? Because that gives me the ultimate flexibility with them, right? So a zero-hour contract is basically you work for me, and I guarantee you zero hours a week of work. And then I can take as many hours as I want from you. But of course, I can slide up and down the benefit scale. I have ultimate flexibility with who I bring in and when I bring them in. So if I have to leave some people in the house of culture, I'm going to put them on a zero-hour contract. So now I've kind of gone through the first step. And I've shown the organization that I can make them some money and save them some money. So now they're like, oh, why don't you come back? Why don't you come back? So now I'm going for the big prize. So I come back, and I say, you know, this is a beautiful building, but I don't see why you have to own it. <laughs> I, I don't see why you would want to own this building. You could sell this building and lease it back to yourself, right? And suddenly you'd have a big wad of cash. Not only could you sell this building to someone, but I can find you something who will can manage all the services for you, do the heating and everything else. So you, you won't have to worry about that. You can get rid of your heating guys. Sell the building, give me the money from that. Now, what happens when you get these organizations? Because now we're in a phase where it is, in fact, public organizations. This is something we once would have done to a fiat factory. But we did it to all of them. They're all fucked. So we've got to come after you guys now. So we, we get this money. And of course, what do we do when we have a big batch of money, a big windfall from selling the house of culture? We go out and borrow more money. And that's what you do if you have any money. You know, you go out and you borrow more money. So we go out and we borrow more money. But we don't just go out and borrow more money. We now begin to take our debts and start to sell them to people. Right? So we have all this debt, and we use that debt, and we go to people and we say, listen, this is the debt from the House of Culture. The German government's not going to let them go under. This is the best piece of debt that you could own. Right? That's what we say to them. This, this is, there's no way anything's going to go wrong with this debt. And then somebody says, well, you know, but uh, that Merkel, I don't think she's going to last. And who knows what kind of nuts going to come in afterwards, you know. No problem. We'll securitize it for you. Which means if it becomes worth less, we'll pay you for that, too. So now we've securitized your... The, your, the debt that you're holding. So we've hedged it. If it goes up or if it goes down, you're still going to make money. Right? At this point, we've almost got to the point what we have created inside this organization, something that I would call an algorithmic institution, right? One that essentially has to run to, to service and continue to pay this debt, this credit rating, et cetera, et cetera. That has to increase its activities. Now, normally at that moment in these organizations, there's a surge because we pour some of the money back in, there's a surge of activity. And people get confused by this. They think, ah, oh, this is a lot better now, right? Suddenly, I'm running double the number of conferences. You know, I'm offering free champagne to people. I got some money here, right? But it's all debt financed, and it's all based on doing more and more and more. And of course, it's all based on putting in new systems, especially these logistics systems. So now we have in place, after we reorganized HR, we put an HR system in place so that we actually don't need human HR guys. We just feed all the information into this HR machine, and it tells you how much you need to pay someone who has on a zero-hour hour contract to work 10 hours, et cetera, et cetera. But not just an HR system. We have IT systems. We have all kinds of systems that we put in place, all based on algorithmic uh, logistics, which is going to make sure that if there's any drop in efficiency anywhere in the organization, we can pick it up, and we can address it. Now, while we're doing all that as management consultants, we're also going over to these finance guys, the ones who can do the securitization for us. And we're starting to think in terms of the way in which we can continue to make money off this debt. And there's a transition that goes on here around 1998, around that period, and then over the next four or five years, when people begin to 
think completely differently about risk. And if there's one thing I would want to say to you today that's worth remembering about the material conditions of all the fights that we're involved in, is this shift in risk is crucial for understanding what you're up against. Because around that time, there's an organization. First of all, 98 is the year that Bill Clinton uh, decides that we're not going to regulate derivatives. They're fine. They're, they're healthy. They should be okay. So we don't we don't uh, put in any legislation to regulate derivatives. I'm going to come back to the derivative in a little bit because it's connected to this. Around this time also, there's an organization called the International Organization of Standardization. Have you ever heard of this? You might know them by their acronym, ISO. Sometimes you see little labels saying ISO. Well, for the conspiracy theorists among us, this is a good organization. It's somewhere in Switzerland, it's private. It's got 3,000 committees. 3,000 committees, right? And it works across a whole range of what they call standardizations and best practices around business, accounting, logistics, et cetera, et cetera. This thing started way back in the 20s. You know, if I had more time, I'd tell you more about it. It's a very interesting organization. It collapsed during World War II, not surprisingly, but the Russians were the first ones who wanted to get it back up and running after World War II, even though it's entirely dedicated to, um, you know, to, to private profit. But they recognized what it was doing by insisting on this standardization of efficiency mechanisms. Anyway, around that time, the important thing for this is that they say, we've got to stop thinking about risk as a problem. And we've got to start thinking about risk as productive. And this is a moment, a crucial moment, in not only the way that we live, but for finance. So at that moment, finance begins to shift all of its tools, all of its mechanisms. And it begins to think in terms of producing more risk all the time. Producing more risk all the time. So now I take that debt from the House of Culture and I take it to my finance guys. They don't say to me, look, we'll make sure this debt is safe. They say to me, we'll make sure this debt is unsafe. This is a movement from imagining value as something that just goes up to imagining value that goes up and down and wanting that. More than that, with the coming of the derivative, it's going to be the move to what I would call value indifference. At that point, what makes something valuable is all the different values it can have all the time and the ways in which we can leverage that. And I, I want to come back to that in a second, but I just want to close the house of culture, so to speak, <laughs> by, by saying, you know, <clears throat> There's something about doing this to a public organization that's particularly cruel. Because if you look closely at the way this is done in private organizations, it's often done to achieve a scale where you have no more competitors. And once you've done it, you start to live fat again, as we see with banks and as we see with corporations. So these efficiency drives, they have a kind of perverse aim in the end, you get to actually profit and benefit from them. In the public sector, this never happens. The, the algorithmic institution just goes on and on and on. There's nothing ever to win. So they're particularly cruel in that, in that sense. Um, and that's why I promise not to turn in my report on the House of Culture. The, um, the, the other thing that happens during this time, in addition to these management consultants, these accountants swarming around. Well, let me say one more word about them before I move on. Now we have a bit more of a picture of why it's accountants who do this work. Because, of, of course, accountants are the guys who are supposed to tell you that something is safe, that something's not risky, that something's OK. But of course, that means they're also the guys who know what's risky. And so they switch over, almost overnight in some cases, from a guy who comes in and says, you'll be fine, to a guy who comes in and says, well, you're fine, but I could make you finer, right? And at that moment, he's starting to take a piece of your risk and see the ways in which he can sell it, hedge it, securitize it, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason that he's thinking that way is his friends are starting to perfect this derivative, right? And m most of you have a sense of what a derivative is already, and it has a, a lot of amazing features to it, and the, the work of Randy Martin and a group in New York right now is are, are, it's kind of, teasing and exploring this out and what some of its consequences are for, for, the, for a kind of way in which it has 
uh, affects a kind of structure of feeling in society today. But the things I want to say about it are just very briefly that, okay, the first thing about it is that it sets itself up, it sets itself up in order to leverage a much larger uh, investment. So it's actually sometimes a very small instrument. It creates risk because when a derivative come in, comes in, it says, I'll sell you a piece of this thing, right? It's a derivative, it's a piece of this thing. And this piece will allow you, for instance, at certain moments, to buy more of it. It will allow you to sell more of it. It will allow you to bundle it with something else and change its value. It will allow you essentially to constantly shift and manipulate and change and multiply what you thought was a simple investment into a whole series of different investment opportunities. And I can play it on the upside, and I can play it on the downside, et cetera, et cetera. And so with that, you get a complete disconnection from our older sense of value that something simply gets, becomes worth more, and that's how we profit. Now we profit all the time, going up, going down, going across, et cetera, et cetera. But most importantly, we profit by constantly placing this product in relationships of difference with other products. And as soon as I begin to securitize this product, I create yet more risk. If I say, look, this thing is safe because you can get it coming and going because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hedge it in both directions for you. I'll sell you both sides of it. Then suddenly, something else doesn't have that arrangement, becomes unsafe. And then you have to do the same thing to that. So I'm trying not to use a technical language around this because you know it's not it's not, in, 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 it's not interesting in that sense. But basically, if we can understand it as this value and difference, it's constantly producing more and more risk, and that risk is making more and more money, we have a bit of a sense of why the derivative has swept through uh, the financial markets. But now I want to come back to this problem of how you implement all this stuff. So you have these management consultants who do this work of identifying risk for product for productivity's sake. But of course, you have also these logistics people. And these logistics people can be understand roughly as the people who have to keep the place working and running under these conditions. These logistics people traditionally played a secondary role with the main people in business who were essentially strategy people. Strategy, though, used to mean kind of planning. So you'd come in and you'd sit down and you'd plan. Now strategy tends to mean the opposite. It tends to be these management consultants coming in, and instead of giving you a plan, they give you more and more uncertainty and volatility. So initially, for the logistics people, this was a pain in the ass, because they needed to run the systems. And the people who were supposed to be running things seemed to be cr creating more and more uncertainty about who would be here next, what would be doing next, et cetera, et cetera. And logistics begins to to, uh, to, to buckle under this. And then at a certain moment, we see a change. And logistics in the literature and everything else begins to get a kind of ambition about itself. Starts to think in terms of genetic uh, <laughs> logistics. Starts to think about itself as a self-perpetuating mechanism. And at this point, it, it develops uh, a kind of ambition, I might say, in which it imagines that it can almost eliminate entirely human agency, have an entirely automatic system. If you read the literature, they talk about the problem of human time and all of the, the various kind of uh, uh, mechanisms they have there. They're like the, my favorite is the Canadian traveler problem. The Canadian traveler problem is you want to go somewhere, but it might snow. Uh, so you have, to, you have to have an, uh, uh, an algorithm that can think about how to make the next mess move uh, in a condition of uncertainty like that, right? So they're thinking about how these systems could keep up with the way that strategy is prodding more and more risk in institutions. They're thinking about how to do that. Now I want to come for a second from there to, because I want to, I want to move on to what's going on with us, because one of the things, I remember I was saying that management's got an eye on both sides of subjectivation, right? So they're, they're worried about the subjectivation that was interesting to Deleuze and, and Negri and everybody else, that moment before you become fully a subject, which is a moment of possibility, right? And this is still in the work of, of Hart and Negri, but, but it was something for Deleuze in the 70s that he was very interested in. And rightly so, there was a lot of it going on. They're worried about that, but they're also seeing some sort of potential in that. 
There seems some sort of potential because it also represents difference, uncertainty, volatility, et cetera, et cetera. And that tracks right through uh, to the present time in the literature. On the other hand, for logistics, subjects are kind of a pain in the ass, right? Once you're a fully formed subject, as far as logistics is concerned, you're an obstacle. You make mistakes, you're too slow, you're in the way, etc. So when, when we get to the point where we have made that move that's so beautifully uh, uh, um, explained by, uh, by Franco Berardi, for instance, in The Soul at Work, or in some of uh, Paolo Verno's work, where we have produced this subjectivity that is willing to labor in a certain kind of way, this, in, this, this, this total way. And of course, we have all our, our, our images that this is based on the model of the, of the art worker or based on the model of the professor, or all these people who don't know when to go home and when they're not working, et cetera, who, who know how to starve, et cetera, et cetera. Right? We get to the point where that model's been produced by management, thinking they're going to get both something very cheap and something very interesting, only to be at the point where now, Basically, they're kind of sick of you. You're, 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 you're kind of slow. You're a bit of a pain in the ass. You're always talking about yourself. You know, it's a pretty high price to pay in order to get something surprising out of you. So, so uh, and logistics, more than anybody else, is worried about that. And frankly, this is the move, you know, this is the move from Guantanamo to drones. The reason there's no pilots and drones is not because they're worried about American, you know, military boys, you know. It's because they're too slow and stupid to operate a drone, right? A drone is working at a completely different pace and with all kinds of information coming into it. There'd be no more point in having a pilot in it. But that's also a move from strategy, which still thinks in terms of a subject, from management as we used to understand it, of manipulating you in these different kinds of ways to get something out of you, in something like Guantanamo, there were still kinds of subjects, and that's the problem. They keep re-emerging as subjects. With drones, there's nobody ever gets to the point where they have an opportunity to emerge as a subject. You know, it's just, they're just a, a, a puff of dust. So in a way, for me, this is a kind of analogy for what's going on in the struggle between strategy and logistics. Logistics is increasingly coming to dominate, more systems being put in place, and as those systems develop, then increasingly we become a kind of obstacle in those systems, right? And, and you, people can feel this in these algorithmic uh, institutions where you start to feel that anybody who has a strong expression in a place, anybody who's doing anything that seems to stand out as a, as a form of, 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 a, uh, of, of subjectivity is, um, you know, is is uh, ostracized or moved to the side in these organizations now, which have to become increasingly uniform, not just in, their, in what they do, but in the kind of mood and personality of the place. So we have this rise of logistics, and there's a, there's a, few, you know, there's a few things to say about this. First, I want to pause for a second and say, uh, I've been trying not to speak metaphorically here. I've been trying to s s not to say that this is like that, but th these things are really happening to us as a series of mechanisms. And I also want to say that coming back to a moment of biography now. So th let me ask myself this question. <clears throat> uh, what am I doing here? Um, and I'm not just here. Uh, I've been at a lot of these things, and I've been steadily lecturing in art academies around Europe and now in, in Asia. What's going on with that? I, I'm going to put myself in illustrious company for a second and say, you know, what, what's Franco Berardi doing here? What, what's, what's Maurizio Lazzarato doing here? Uh, and my answer to you is that essentially at this moment in the financialization of the art market, uh, we are those accountants. We are those accountants who come from the outside and introduce new possibilities of risk, new product productivity around risk. We don't, we don't do the finance stuff. We don't tell you how much it's worth. We, often, we don't even talk about art. I mean, the, the experts still tell you how much it's worth, right? They still value it, the curator, the art critic, et cetera, et cetera. But increasingly, 
we're involved in introducing this volatility by introducing all this other subject matter, which in turn allows you to say about the artwork, what haven't we put it in difference with? What haven't we put it in conjunction with? In what ways have we not considered it? What risk is in that piece of art and in that artist that's yet to be considered? This, of course, becomes productive of imagining more situations, combinations, et cetera, that can emerge out of that than from a straightforward notion that in an art market, stuff just becomes more valuable because it gets written about in a certain way or whatever the, the model might be. Now we have a kind of volatility that enters because of how much of the world enters into consideration in relationship. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, all these books like Social Works and uh, Artificial Hells and One to Many and, uh, you know, Dark Matter and all that stuff, that there's not something in the way they're explaining it. But I am suggesting that there's a certain materiality and finance below that, which is much, which is always interested in creating risk inside its products. And I think that that kind of risk is increasingly being created uh, in the art market, and that essentially I'm playing a minor role as a, as a management consultant in that process um, by, um, by entering from the outside in that way. Where I want to finish, though, is <clears throat> obviously, as I expected, I spent more time on capital than I did on labor. And all along, labor is you know, in, in a situation of resisting and sometimes producing these mechanisms that we're talking about through its resistance. But I would also like to just come back to the theme of the conference and to what I would regard also as the link to infrastructure, a certain kind of social infrastructure. If we think for a minute about the origins of the West, and we think for the minute about the origins of logistics, these are the two, these are the same thing. These are the same thing. They, they were precisely the same thing. They are born together um, in a wicked and bloody birth. And what I mean by that, of course, is that the first great and horrible task of logistics was the Atlantic slave trade. That was the first mass logistics that we know in the modern world. It gives birth to the West, and it also gives birth to logistics. And if I want to emphasize to you a certain opportunity that comes with logistics, it has in part to do with being able to inherit something from this terrible birth. Because as strategy and management have decided that they're sick of you as subjects, logistics increasingly becomes interested in you as the not yet subject, as the not full subject, as the not complete subject. And in that sense, it harkens back to a process of subjectivation that we can associate with chattel slavery, and especially with this massive logistical dislocation. Edouard Glissant said, people who made the Middle Passage, they consented not to be a single being that there is a kind of inheritance, which because it is also the origin of the West is our inheritance, though we often choose to deny it. There's a kind of inheritance of a subjectivation that doesn't happen, that has to do something else besides become a subject, and that does this together. And one way that I would ask you to think about it is to think about this in terms of logistics, in terms of being shipped in terms of being shipped. When you are shipped, if you think about that from the old Marxist perspective of the standpoint, right? We, Lukács said, well, the standpoint of the proletariat allows them to see a world that the rest of us are not seeing. Later, feminists said, the feminist standpoint needs to be considered and understood. The shipped had the standpoint of everything and nothing. They were in every circuit of capital. They were in every standpoint, and therefore not in any. They were workers. They were the, the, the commodity that could speak, though Marx speaks not of them in that way. They were the commodity that could speak. They were the transportation. They were the realization in the buying and selling 
uh, rape and social reproduction. They were in every circuit of capital. The standpoint, therefore, was a standpoint that could never cohere itself into what we understood as a subject. This is now a condition that we're starting to inherit and share. So many people have never left it, of course. It's a condition that, curiously, logistics is goading us with. Logistics is, wants to play in that game, wants to be in there, is interested in recombining aspects of us below the level of a proper subject, which it finds troublesome. But what I want to leave you with is that I don't think it even knows the definition of trouble till it begins to start to deal with this inheritance, which found ways other than moving from subjectivation to subject to be together in the world. And this, for me, that being together in the world, that consent not to be a single being, is what infrastructure could and might be. Thank you.